Blue Jays, baseball, and more Blue Jays. It's the walk-off with Scott Belford and Adam Mack on 365 Sportscast. This ball is crushed. The radio show for everything Toronto Blue Jays. And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the walk-off. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our first time on 365 Sportscast Network. We're so excited to be joining the team here. We'll give you a little rundown all about ourselves. So my name is Scott Belford. I am hosting this thing. Joining me, my good friend, my cohort, my co-host, Hello, Adam everybody. Mack. Proof that he <laughs> is existent. And uh, our show runs every single Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And we are a Blue Jays focused podcast. So we're going to talk everything Toronto Blue Jays. We might touch on some stuff Canadian baseball wise in general, but uh, most of the focus is going to be on the Blue Jays. And then, of course, we'll also touch on some of the big things in Major League Baseball. Um, If you are a big Blue Jays fan, I suggest that you tune uh, or subscribe, I should say, to our YouTube page because we actually, even just this morning, we talked with Tim Meza out of the bullpen. We'll actually be airing a little clip of that on the show, probably around the 40-minute mark. So uh, you can look forward to that a little further down the road here. But that is going to be on our YouTube page on Friday. The full interview will be up. We've already talked to former Blue Jays, guys like Greg Zahn, guys like Shea Hillenbrand. We actually just talked to Hillenbrand uh, last week. And his interview was incredible. Uh, Some of you Jays fans may remember him from back in 2006. Him and former manager John Gibbons had that big dust up where they just about got into fisticuffs. And he kind of deep dives into that. And then we also talked to a bunch of Toronto Blue Jays prospects, guys like Jordan Groshins, Josh Palacio, Adam Kloffenstein, Joey Murray. The list goes on and on. And again, that's all on our YouTube page. Now, we've been running this podcast, Adam, how long now? Yeah, about Eight July months? of last year. July last year is when we started, and we were running a podcast every single Monday. What we've done now is we've joined the 365 Sportscast Network. Our show will be Tuesday, and then on YouTube on Wednesday, and rebroadcast here on 365 Sportscast on Wednesday. And then we'll do our regular podcast that used to run on Monday on Friday. And I think that's pretty much our house cleaning to, to, to start Sounds things off here. It. So, like I said, Tim Meza, we'll talk to him in uh, about 40 minutes. We'll throw to him and find out about uh, his recovery over Tommy John surgery. We will get into the last week of Blue Jays baseball. They kicked off their opening series against the Yankees. Home opener for the Texas Rangers yesterday. They were at, live at Globe Life Park in front of a full crowd. We'll get into that. We'll talk Fernando Tatis Jr. going down yesterday scary night. Stuff. Very scary stuff for the Padres. All right, my man. Let's get into it. Let's talk some Blue Jays. Where do we start? Want to go back to New York? You know what? I do want to go back to New York. I want to talk TJ Zoik for a second here. Now, as most of you Blue Jays fans are aware, our starting rotation has had some bumps and bruises over spring. Still waiting on Nate Pearson's return. Robbie Ray fell down the stairs and bruised his elbow. So we're waiting on his return, which kind of gave the next man up a chance. And that next man up was TJ Zoik. And you know what, Manny? He looked really good. I was actually pretty impressed with the way he dealt with the Yankees hitters. Now, TJ is a two-seam fastball guy. Regularly, starters are throwing four-seamers these days, so he's a little bit different look to the hitters. He's a ground ball pitcher, pitches to contact. So that's not a bad thing, especially in Yankee Stadium, keeping the ball on the ground. And he's six foot seven. Big boy. So he just is a monster of a man and tough to pick up the ball out of his hand. Um. I don't know, man. I don't know how you felt about about that Saturday game. That was the one loss the Jays did suffer from the Blue Jays. It wasn't even that bad, I didn't no. feel like. You were live streaming at the time. It was death by bloopers. Yeah, it really was. Not much to say otherwise. Um, Gary Sanchez continues to 
irritate me, but <laughs> a couple homers yeah. from Gary against the Jays. I, I don't know what it is about that man. Blue Jays fans, we don't like him. It's his face. He's got a he's got a face. No, we don't like. We're making a list of punchable faces, uh, and he's on it. Him and Bryce Harper. That's <laughs> Gary Sanchez is a top ten guy. Yeah, he's behind Bryce Harper, yeah. but. Uh... So obviously we're going to see TJ Zoik a little bit more. And am I saying that Zoik is going to be the solution to this starting rotation? <laughs> no, obviously not. But the dream is this is a guy with some, some minor league acumen to him. He's been around the team for a few years now in the Blue Jays system. He's comfortable with pitching coach Pete Walker. And if he can bridge the gap until we start getting some of these guys back like Pearson and Ray – or maybe even put the pressure on Tanner Rourke to, well, pitch better than he did last year is basically the nice way of putting that. Where do you fall on TJ Zoik, my man? Do you think that he's a guy that the front office is watching and prepared to move $12 million Tanner Rourke to, let's say, the bullpen? Or do you think that this is uh, Rourke would really need to blow up for that to happen. I know there's a lot of hate for Rourke. I'm not willing to give up on him yet. I I still am excited by Rourke. I think I think he he definitely has a spot in our rotation. I think he's going to have a long leash at the start of the year, even if he has a slow start, but I don't think he will against the Rangers today. We'll, we'll touch on that more. Yeah. But uh, I yeah. think Zoic, I think it's just a non-sexy Band-Aid. He's a Jonathan yeah, Davis Yeah, I type, think that's... In my opinion. Yeah, exactly, exactly. He's uh, a, a ham and egger as my... There you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, so he'll he'll get the job done. I don't think he's the solution. You brought up a really good point with Tanner Rourke, and we're going to see him tonight. Um, I can't see how he can get any worse <laughs> than last year. I, like, I really think we're only going to see a better Tanner Rourke it may not be a Tanner Rourke that we still want in the rotation, but I mean, he was pushing a 70 RA last year. I think that he's going to be a lot closer to his career average of around, I think it's 5.6. It's still not pretty. He's still a number five guy in your rotation, but every rotation needs a number five guy. And, and hopefully Rourke can uh, pick up the slack here because the cupboard is kind of bare for the next guy up. Like, I don't know. Anthony Kay's in AAA. He's going to get a chance. Yeah. Um, you know, Julian Merriweather, they were talking about starting him, but he's just kicking so much butt at the back end of that bullpen. I don't wish to see them do a damn thing with him, but leave Absolutely. him right where he is. And why don't we even... Let's skip on over let's to Julian Merriweather yeah. while I bring that up. Uh, um a lot of excitement about this man amongst Blue Jays fans. A lot of excitement about the back end of this bullpen. Let's be serious. Jordan Romano has looked phenomenal all of 2020. He looks like the same guy this year. In fact, to the point where Blue Jays fans are saying, is this the next Dwayne Ward and Tom Hankey combo? Now, listen, <laughs> we're two games into 2021. Let's not completely jump off the deep end here. However, you look at these guys, Acumen and Buddy, how do you not get excited? Like, how do you not get excited? I can't remember the last time that I was this into a reliever. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who didn't get a chance to see Julian Merriweather pitch on Thursday in the season opener or yesterday night, Sunday, was last or was night, it yeah. yesterday night that he? No, it was, it was it Sunday. Was Sunday. Yeah, yesterday was Dolis. Right, Dolis. Okay, we'll touch on Dolis in a minute yeah. too, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, so Thursday and Sunday we got to see Julian Merriweather come in. He pitched the 10th on the Thursday, and then he pitched the 9th. He, is, he has two saves. This is a guy who's throwing 100 miles an hour and then follows it up with an 80-mile-an-hour His His uh, changeup dips it into is, the 70s. It's yeah. nasty. It's a 20 mile an hour difference. And as if that's not messing with a hitter's timing enough, he throws an 88 mile an hour <laughs> slider just to really mix things up, right? All of them 10 miles an hour different in, in pitch speed. 
it messes with the hitter's timing so bad. And another super impressive thing about this kid, and I shouldn't even say kid, he's 30 years old. But another impressive thing about Merriweather is his control this year has been phenomenal. He's picking corners. He's moving up and down in the strike zone. He's moving side to side. Like when he struck out um, Aaron Hicks to start the 10th inning on Thursday, he he threw an 97 mile an hour fastball and followed that up with an 80 mile an hour changeup and 79 mile an hour changeup. And Hicks <laughs> just stood there. Like, how do you even, how do you gear up for 97, 98, 99 miles an hour? And then his delivery, his changeup looks exactly the same delivery wise as his fastball. And you don't know it's a changeup till it's coming out of his hand. That's how, the thing is, it just freezes the guys. Like, by the time you frozen. pick it up, it's, it's uh, a halfway thing of beauty. To the plate and you just say, <laughs> well, I'm not even going to swing at all because I'm going to look so stupid if I start my swing now. Exactly. Speaking of stupid. Giancarlo Stanton looks stupid all weekend, and that was music to my ears. Uh, my isn't it? Isn't it nice to see? Like when when Merriweather struck <laughs> him out, and he went. It's funny. He watched Hicks get struck out on changeups, and then Giancarlo Stanton comes in, gets two eighty-eight mile an hour sliders, one on each side of the plate, and then Merriweather goes ninety-nine miles an hour in and up. Like, he literally, Stanton walked away shaking his head while the Yankees fans <laughs> booed him. Love to see the Yankees fans back in the uh, back in the stadium. Let your boys know. Someone's got to. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great. You're right, man. Uh, Stanton, they took care of business. The Jays took care of Stanton pretty all much the whole long, weekend. Yeah. yeah, all series long. And I know we've mentioned this before, but it's super important for this Blue Jays team to go 9 and 10 in the 19 games that they play the Yankees. I don't even need them to be above 500. Just mm-hmm. be close. Be in that 9 9 win yeah. 10 loss realm and going to uh going into New York in that first series and taking two like we're down to 7 it's the wins. The magic number, 7 wins. The magic. But then that only counts if we beat up on the teams we got to beat up on like the Texas Rangers. Like the Texas Rangers. That's a very good point. So I know we're jumping all over the place here. Uh, I did want to keep with pitching. Speaking of the Texas Rangers, season opener for them at Globe Life Park yesterday. We've talked about this before. Personally, it was beautiful to see a full ball- ballpark. I mean, I hope everything works out. There's no super spreading and all that 40, stuff. 40,000 in the stands. Uh, 40,000 in the stands. It was kind of messed <laughs> up to see. Um uh, but it was exciting, you know, like watching from a distance. I wouldn't have necessarily wished to have been in the <laughs> thick of that, but watching from a distance, it was so fun, man. It felt like a real ball game. It felt like we were watching just regular yes. baseball, and there was something sort of freeing about that, you know? Mats, Steven Mats, was pitching yesterday. It was his season debut. Now, they got, they got Steven out of the Mets, Traded for him in the off season, and there was a lot of disappointment from Jays fans. It wasn't so much that Steven Matz was who they brought in; it was more so that they were hoping for a Trevor Bauer type impactful right. arm added to this rotation. I think when they signed Springer, everyone knew that Bauer wasn't the guy. They were still hoping. I know my I, myself; I was in that category of hoping for a Jake Odorizzi type of signing. It didn't happen. And they brought in Steven Matz. And, and I mean, we've talked about Pete Walker before, pitching coach for the Blue Jays. He's, he's a special guy, man. He, he has an ability to see a problem in a pitcher that maybe others are missing. Because he's, he's great at those reclamation projects. Now, I, I think it's way too early to do anything but just say Matz had a good first game. But he had a very good first game. He pitched into the seventh inning, 6.1. Innings pitched, Pete. eight strikeouts, dude. No, it was great. I mean, yeah, was it against the Rangers? Yes. Do the Rangers suck? Yes. Yes. But was he hitting the strike yes. zone? Yes. <laughs> Did he have good control? Yes. yes. Like, you can't totally write everything off as well. It was a good start against a bad team. The Rangers are still a major league team, and major league teams will still make you pay 
if you're not throwing with control, using each side of the plate, and Matt's managed Absolutely. to do both of those things. He threw 93 pitches. Uh, great first game Absolutely. of the year for him. Very, very... Um, Maybe not exciting, but it kind of calms the nerves if you're a Blue Jays fan, right? Seeing him come in and do what he did, because we're going to need a number two in this rotation. It was supposed to be Robbie Ray. He's on the IL right now. Hopefully he's back soon. Supposed to be Nate Pearson. Same thing, right? So we need somebody to pick up that ball and pitch after Hinjin Ryu or wherever in the lineup. And and Steven Matz might be that guy. No, I think the future's bright with Matz. It's, again, one of those non-sexy additions to the team but Moves. necessary right agreed and if he works out blue jays fans will jump on board <laughs> right yeah absolutely so starting lineup today uh everyone's favorite now we watched danny jansen take a ball in the knee yesterday and he stayed in the game he finished the, the inning, rest yeah. of that inning finished the inning and then you saw alondro kirk come in He's getting the start today. I don't think it's anything to worry about. I think Kirk was going to catch this game anyways, especially with Hinjin Ryu pitching tomorrow's uh, getaway game. And they really want to pair Danny Jansen with Hinjin Ryu mm-hmm. as much as they can. So I think we saw that coming anyways. Fingers crossed that Danny's knee is fine because the last thing we need right now is to do a catching shuffle to start this season. I think it was just a bruise. That said... Yeah, I think it's just a bruise, too. Like, we both watched it happen. There's no little bones in your knee. It's just it's an impact injury. It's not a twist or anything like that. If it was a twist, if it was a collision at home plate, you're a little more scared. But uh, speaking of scary injuries, we had a a brief panic attack when Vladdy took one off the hand. Yeah. You don't like to see that hit by a pitch yesterday. And one of, like... How many times did the Jays get hit At yesterday? At least three, three, maybe four, four times. times. All the kids got it. Kevin got one. Bichette got one. Flatty got one. Flatty's was the scariest though because well, he was we were... jumping right around. As soon as he got it, he was doing yeah, the Yeah, he. Pokey. you could tell it hurt. Yeah, you could tell it hurt. But it looked like it hit the end of the right. bat and ricocheted the crap out of his hand, right? Like, it just looked like he just really... It's got a stinger. You know, that, yeah. that sting, yeah. So he stayed in the game. No pinch runner, nothing like that. So, yeah, I'm sure he'll be fine. Yeah, he uh, he's having a heck of a start to the season. I, I'm with you. Hopefully he's fine. And it looks like he was. So that's fine. It's funny because watching watching those Jays get like by the by the third time a guy was hit. I was like in 2016, this would have been the third <laughs> bench clearing brawl. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I know we did just touch on Kirk. Um, we, I know this is our first show on, on 365 Sportscast, so you haven't heard us talk about this before, but leading up to Kirk making the team out of spring training, we had kind of predicted that in Shapiro and Atkins fashion, asset management would have come into play. time manipulation. Which, exactly, where maybe you leave Kirk down, you retain Reese McGuire because hopefully you can sneak him through uh, through waivers because he's out of all options later in the in the start of the season, right? So, like, if you were to put him on waivers now, a lot of teams would have already done their depth moves, and hopefully he would clear waivers. But they did the right thing. Kirk made the opening day roster. He was the better catcher in spring training. He had an amazing spring. But I, I only bring this up because it's kind of funny. They did put Reese McGuire on waivers. They DFA'd him. We all he expected it. somebody would pick him up. Yeah, we thought someone would him. have a Dollar Tree parking lot with his oh, name Scott. on it. And no, it wasn't the case. <laughs> exactly. That joke will never never get old. Uh, but so Reese McGuire going back to AAA and the Blue Jays retain his rights. And you know what? This might be something that a few years down the road, we're like, I can't believe we were able to trade Reese McGuire for this guy. Or I can't believe that Reese McGuire is on this team and is our starting catcher. Like, that's the thing is, is McGuire does have some cachet to him. That's a reason why this 
front office has taken so long to give up on him because they do see talent in this kid. He is only 24 years old. He's got a great left arm. hitting, good bat. He's he call, he's left-handed hitting catcher. He's got a good arm, like I said. Um, interesting to see what what plays out for all Reese from here on out, because there are other big catching prospects in this Blue Jays system. Very Gabriel Morano, Riley Adams, who is on the taxi squad. They just picked up Gratterall veteran catcher out of uh, Los Angeles. They traded the Dodgers some cash for him. So the Blue Jays are well stocked on catching. We'll see how things play out. I really hope Kirk just takes the reins and Absolutely. run with it, though. I don't know. I'm excited by him. You're feeling a little... I So for those of you out there that are hearing us for the first time, Adam's never been overly high on Danny Jansen. <laughs> but he's starting to come around a little. He's, he's Danny's I'm, looked good over I'm the start of this season. I'm trying hard to find everything I can to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, <laughs> I have a... Something I live and die by is given credit where credit's due. It's the only way I can sleep at night yeah. when I complain about people or performances or anything like that. So when he starts slumping and he starts going off the rails, he's going to hear it. For, well, he won't hear it from me, but everybody else will hear it from me about him. But in the yes. meantime, as long as he's competent, I'm going to toot his horn. What's the most impressive thing you've seen out of Jansen this? Well, for me, it's just the way he's working the pitch count. Start of the season. Yes, that I was going to bring that up, and I wanted you to say it. <laughs> Absolutely. Should we start right with game one against Garrett Cole? It's been Garrett impressive. Cole? Was it yeah. 15 pitches, his first two at-bats against Garrett Cole? Yeah, a hit and a, and a, a strikeout. But even though that, that first at-bat was a strikeout, nine it was pitch. a nine-pitch at-bat. Which, I mean, if you can get out of your and number nine you're, guy, yeah. it, just, it goes a long way, right? Well, just look at it in, in the fact Garrett Cole pitched... I, I'd need to look back. I think it was 90-ish pitches right. that game. And to see your number nine hitter go one for three and take 20 of those yeah. pitches, exactly. very impressive. And that is what we have lacked with our catching position on this Blue Jays team is the bat. Both Danny Jansen and Reese McGuire didn't have it last yeah. year. They were ice cold, god awful. That's why we saw Couldn't Kirk. get above hitting 200. Bring in call, yeah, it's bring why Kirk we saw Kirk, nothing exactly. Nothing short of a desperation move. Yeah. He hadn't played above A ball. Of course it was desperation. They're like, we're going into the playoffs and our catcher's hitting a buck yeah. 65. Like, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> Jansen had to get hot at the end of the year to hit 180. Yeah. Anyways. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, the Blue Jays' offense has looked great so far. Big news on that front, though. George Springer looks like he's coming back from injury. Live he batting took, practice uh, today. Live live batting practice today. Yeah. 17 pitches. He went 4-4-11. Um, of course, it's the alternate site, and it's simulated, so they're just kind of right. guessing what he went. I'm like, what a weird <laughs> stat to release. He went 4-4-11 four, four, in a simulated game. Okay. Yeah. You know, Blue Jays fans are desperate for Springer news when they're releasing that kind of info. Right? And I loved it. I was like, hey, 4-for-11. Four, four, He's hitting above 300 against our alternate yeah. site pitchers. <laughs> but, man, it is going to be fun to see him come back. He's eligible um, to come off the IL on the 8th, which is Thursday, which is the home opener quote unquote home opener of course the jays starting this year in dunedin at td ballpark but i think when springer comes off the il i think it will be thursday his oblique seems to be fine he's done a bunch of sprinting he's pitched live or uh, i should say hit live batting practice like we just said so when he comes back where do you see him in the lineup Adam? Well, he's gonna be our leadoff hitter right he's gotta be leadoff right now, do you just shimmy everyone down from there? So I'll, I'll lead you our, I'll read you our, uh, so this is our starting lineup for today. Marcus Simeon is in the one hole. Kevin Biggio hitting second. Bo Bichette third. Teoscar Hernandez fourth. Vladdy Guerrero fifth. Sixth is Lourdes Gurriel Jr. Seventh, Rowdy Telez. Randall Grishuk in the eight hole. And Ola Alondro, uh, Captain Kirk in that number nine hole. Obviously, Telez 
loses his spot, yeah. right? Now, do you swap Biggio down? Do you move? I think what I Springer to I the. I think I would leave. Ooh, that's tough. We've got such a deep lineup. Isn't that a deep lineup? Because you do love to see Springer, Simeon, Bichette, Hernandez. I think I would keep. Uh... I would keep Simeon and Biggio in the top three. I'd move Bichette down. Yeah, so I think really? I keep uh, Hernandez. Now, is that because is that because Bichette's yes. struggling a little and you'd like to give him some protection? Okay, I like that idea. I mean, who knows? Maybe yeah, the next like two games idea. he blows up and I could just shut my mouth. But no, and it's true he has struggled to start the season. He struggled to start the spring. He's he's struggling. I'm not at all worried spring. about him, but it's something to note. No, I'm not worried either. Yeah, it is something to... And, I mean, we've talked about this before, too, that I think that this batting lineup is going to be a revolving door all year long. I think Montoya is going to tweak it and play with it and be moving guys who are hotter up the lineup and guys who are colder down. You know, as we've said numerous times, basically everyone in this lineup, save for Biggio and Jansen, have 30 home run potential, so... They do. They all have power. And even even Biggio, I mean, we saw him crank one yesterday. He's probably still a 20 yeah, home run guy. Exactly. You know, like he was on pace for that last year. Anyways. I think, honestly, the only thing standing in Telez and Grichik's way will be playing time. I don't think they're going to see yes. enough at bats to hit I, 30 home runs. And who knows? This is one thing I do want to talk a little bit sure. about Randall Grichik because, man, he's he, he's had an incredible spring. And I, I mean, you uh, you get on your horse every time this gets brought up, and you have to tell everyone spring training doesn't matter, which is a very <laughs> only true injuries point. Injuries matter in the spring. He ha- only injuries matter in the spring. But Randall had a very good spring, and with George Springer on the IL, he's been given at bats every single game, and he is taking advantage of him. He's hitting 400 right now. I know we're four games in, and obviously he's not a 400 hitter. Nobody is, but. He has been clutch. He is hitting when runners are in scoring position. And he's making it very tough for Charlie Montoya to take him out of this lineup. And Jonathan Davis had his first start of the year yesterday. And it wasn't Grishuk that got the the hook. It was Lourdes Gurriel Jr. who sat on the bench yesterday. And I think that as long as Randall keeps hitting... Now, this has been... Grishik's MO all along is that he's streaky, right? Like I remember 2019 watching him in June and being like, why is this guy still in the lineup? And he'd just been signed to that big new contract. And, and I think he, he was hitting well under 200. He hadn't hit a home run yet. And then he finished the year with 31 yeah. home runs. So, like, when he's hot, he's hot. When he's cold, (laughs) yikes, get him out of there. But this is a beautiful setup for this scenario, right? Like, when when Grishik is cold, well, guess what? Rowdy Telez is going to start seeing some more at-bats. We're not going to see some of these outfield guys take as many breaks, right? And that's all that will happen. Maybe when Guriel needs a day off, they stick Kevin Biggio in left, move Vladdy to third, put Rowdy at first. The, the versatility on the on the field for this Toronto Blue Jays team is yes. very exciting, man. Speaking of versatility, this is something that we've kind of gone back and forth with Bichette and Guerrero basically since they entered the major leagues. I guess, honestly, even before they got yeah. called up, was uh, they were playing third base and shortstop. A lot of speculation whether Bichette had the arm strength to be a shortstop and if Vlad was really built to be a third baseman. So Vlad's now made the transition to first, and he looks great yeah, so that, far. That one question's yeah. been answered. I hope yeah. he just leans into it and is fine with it now, because he's, he's looking great at first. I mean, you see, And I know where you're going with, with this, and I'll let you continue, but I do want to bring up, Vladdy has looked great at first. He's looked he's like a, a pick and machine, machine at it's, times. It's and unfortunate I mean, I that he's had to be a pick and machine. But yes, which is where we get to the next point. <laughs> I will make note of Vladdy's had a couple foot issues staying on the bag at first. Um, not mm-hmm. necessarily with a wild throw that's offline and has pulled him off. I mean, you got to leave the bag to make the play. That's fine. But when he's trying to shorten the throw and he's reaching said, forward for it 
and his foot comes off. That's yeah. the concern. I'm not concerned long term because yeah. it is. But it is, I some, think, 20 games into yeah, him it, playing first Yeah, it's something that'll come well. with more reps, yeah. right? He'll get a feel for it. But yeah. I'm just yeah. the fact that he's digging everything out of the dirt, really encouraging to see. Yeah. Especially after last 100%. Year. I don't know how many saw how many pass now, balls we saw at first base last year. So many, so many. He has put in the work this off season. His body is he looks so like an athlete now. And that was the, one thing he didn't look the, like. Yeah. At, at bat for him. So now the discouraging part of this is how many balls he has had to pick. Which is where we go with Bo Bichette. I'm sure that's where you were yes. you were headed. So what do you I'm not happy with it. No, I, of course not. How how long of a rope? Here's the thing. We do have a an all-star shortstop playing second base right now. How much rope does Bo Bichette get? How, how much does he Infinite? get? Or how much should he get? How much I think does he, gets he all get? Of it. He gets all of it, yeah. They're not moving so. him, are they? It would need to be a total disaster for them to move Bo Bichette off a yeah. of shortstop. Even if the best shortstop on this team is Marcus Simeon. <laughs> yeah, sad to say. Uh, I don't think he's going anywhere this year. I don't think he's going anywhere next year. But sooner or later, he could be you're a honest gold glove second baseman. Your honest opinion, do you think he's going to be fine, though? What do you mean? I mean, his arm strength has looked bad. It doesn't look like he's had it this year so far. But do you think that that's just spring training? We're early on. Do you think he's fine? Uh, I don't think he's fine. I think I'm, okay. I'm worried about it all year. I've been watching okay. him skip balls into the dirt. The throws have been online, but they're mm -hmm. coming up five feet short. I'm watching him double clutch mm -hmm. and throw and have guys beating out infield hits. Anything that is to the grass that he's making a throw on, I'm not even watching the rest of the play. I know he's safe. Yeah, That's not what we need from a shortstop to be a World Series contender, period. Like, end of story. So, like, that unless he true. can increase his arm strength by 30% in the next two years. But we're not going to be... Here's Which is my, possible. Here's my hot takes I don't know. Call. We're not going to be a World Series contender hey. as long as Bichette's playing shortstop. Wow. I, Time will yeah. tell. That's an interesting take. And I, believe me, his throws have concerned me this year. But what's funny, dude, is this wasn't something that was standing out to me last year. But, may, but maybe it's because Guerrero's defense was so bad that nobody else's defense yeah. stood out to me. Could be. I don't know. I, I, hope, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I think I'm excited about Jordan Groshans. I'm excited about Austin Martin. I think I think those are guys. Yeah. Those guys are going to take his position. And I think both of those guys are continuing to take reps in the minor leagues. I, I think they're continuing to play shortstop. I know that seems to be what the Jays are planning yep. to do with them. And in true Blue Jays fashion, it looks like they're going to move him around a bunch. Now, one last thing I'll say about uh, Austin about Martin, Armstrong, I mean, too. Yeah, is. Uh, you're not yep. going to find a bigger Kevin Biggio fan than this guy right here. Yes, that's true. He's making some great plays defensively, but I'm also concerned about his arm strength. But he hasn't really bounced any balls. No, but, I mean, we'll see any. You just want to be concerned, concerned about something. I don't want to be too. I'm trying to temper <laughs> my expectations is what this is. We're three and one. We're top of the yeah. at least. Let's be honest. This is a super exciting time to be a Blue Jays fan. Yeah. I'm just. Yeah. Us and Baltimore. This is just something I inherited from my mom. <laughs> I'm trying to be pessimistic. Keep my expectations low. And then I won't be disappointed when we miss the playoffs. I love it. That's so funny, dude. All right. Should we touch on some. We are going to. We are going to. We are going to get to Tim Meza in a second here. We'll throw to him in about five minutes. And the clip we're going to air for you, he really gets into the nitty-gritty of what Tommy John's surgery is all about. He tells us about how he felt right after the pitch when he knew that it was happening. He tells us about 
the process of getting the surgery, what it was like, where they took the ligament from. He gets into the mental side of how difficult it is to be injured. It is just a fantastic insight into a guy recovering. And it's a beautiful end of his story because he came all the way back and won a spot in this yeah. bullpen, which is fantastic. So we will talk to Tim Mays in a moment here. Before we do that, I did want to touch on a couple things throughout Major League Baseball before we do that. The first thing I want to talk about is Mets fans are losing their mind over some Jacob deGrom stats that have recently come out, and I just <laughs> love it. Um, it is pretty insane. So this is Jacob deGrom has made 77 starts over his last three years. He has 25 victories with a 1.11 ERA. Games he did not win, 52, in which he had a 2.58 ERA. He's 0-19 wow. in that time. So, obviously, Toronto fans, we can relate to this. We Roy all watched Halliday. Roy Halladay Absolutely. in his prime. Going there. And those years just be tossed to the wayside by terrible teams. And this is where Mets fans are starting to freak out because they're watching literally, quite possibly, the greatest pitcher of all time. DeGrom truly has an argument for the right. GOAT. And they have done nothing with him. Yeah. <laughs> Mets look they good do. this year, though. I think they are going to do something with them, and their starting rotation is one of the best in baseball. Absolutely. Do you think Mets fans are losing their mind yes, for no but I reason? Love it. Same with the Yankees fans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Mets, you, you are the better New York team. And speaking of great pitchers, do you want to touch on Shohei Otani quickly? Yes. And then we'll, uh, we'll what mention a fun the Fernando Tatis injury. Some scary news there in San Diego. And then head off to. Yeah. Uh, yeah so Shohei Otani, I mean, if you're not paying attention to him, you're on the East Coast. <laughs> Stay up later. Because, my God, the man is putting on a show right now for the Los Angeles Angels. That Babe Ruth he reputation. Is... Oh, my God, man. Like, I was watching a clip of him from Sunday night, and he was pitching. Now, I think he took the loss in that game, but nonetheless, he put on a show. He was just, I think, pitched six and a half innings, something like that. He was throwing the ball 100 miles an hour, but there was one inning, I think it was the fourth, where he came up to bat. He, he got... Three up, three down, was throwing 100 mile an hour fastballs, came up and then had the, the highest exit velo so far this year and hit a 450 foot monster yeah. Did home you hear run. The sound of that home run? Oh, Anybody that has it, just sound, look eh? it up on YouTube or something. What a crack of the bat yeah, that was. It is just like, there. it was a no doubter. It was one of those ones where you didn't even need to see it. The second you heard that crack, you're like, this is Speaking gone. of knowing it, as soon as you see it, Fernando Tatis Jr. went down yesterday. Yeah. What a bummer. Uh, if you're a Padres fan, this one hurts, and it looks like it's going to be a pretty long-term injury. Now, he had an injury come up They're in uh, up spring training months. with his shoulder. He said, yeah. ah, don't worry about it. I've had it my whole career. That. I told you at the scary. time. I as said, soon as I that heard him put, say that, that doesn't you put my did. Mind You're like, at all. That is a worse red flag. No, that's a red Absolutely. flag. And it yeah. was again. He brings this up after the, the 14 year contract. contract. No kidding. So the Padres Man, got uh, so $5 wild. million dollars a game so far this year. He's played five games, yeah. $25 million. That's his salary. And, and he's for out the for year. the year. Hopefully he comes back healthy next year, but. Do you think we'll see him by the end of the year? And Do you that's think they'll bring him back. I don't know. I don't. I think it would be stupid if they rushed him back. Right? I think you just you give that if he. You know what? If this was a five year contract, yeah. that's different. Okay, but you're on the hook for fourteen years, and the kid's yeah. twenty two. You're gonna try no, and push this guy? Not. No, especially hearing him say ridiculous things like, "Oh, don't worry about my shoulder. It's hurt for years." Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no. Uh, I won't not worry about it. Of course, I'm incredibly worried about Absolutely. this. What do you mean? So hopefully he gets healthy. I think the Padres are still going to be an incredible team to watch. They've still got that incredible um, starting rotation. They're going to be a fun team. But this is a, a very worrisome turn of events. Absolutely. All right. Tim Meza. 
Tim Meza, everybody enjoy. We'll be back in about, uh, the clip's about 15 minutes, so we'll say goodbye before we wrap this show up. Hey guys, this is Tim Meza with the Toronto Blue Jays, and you're listening to the Walk Off Podcast with Scott Belford and Adam Mack. Do you mind if we get into your injury and recovery a little here? Not at all. Not at all. Okay, okay, because I know from a fan standpoint, when it comes to Tommy John surgery, it is so prevalent in baseball these days that it almost becomes in a sense commonplace and just a thing that you kind of look at like from a fan standpoint, like, oh, no big deal. But it is a huge deal. So let's kind of go back over this. September 13th, 2019, you're pitching against the Yankees, extra innings, and I remember watching this game. I remember that pitch to D.D. Gregorius where you stepped off the mound and you felt something. Was it that instant? Was it that pitch? Or were you kind of feeling some stuff up to that and that was the straw that broke the camel's back? Like, how did that whole thing play out? Yeah, uh, interesting. It's interesting. Um, I don't think I think it was that one pitch um, that kind of just just tore everything um, open um, and and kind of caused the injury. Was that was that one pitch? Uh, but you know, I, I went on the IL earlier that year and and didn't have any setbacks coming back from that. I went on the IL for ten days with a little nerve nerve problems in, in my elbow, but after the ten days, I was good to go. And and it was intriguing. Like you know, I'd say a week before I was throwing you know, the hardest I'd thrown that year, like actually saw kind of a spike in velo um, entering that week. And then just, just that pitch, just, just felt it um, almost as soon as, as soon as I released it. Um, and, and the only way I can kind of explain it is like a burning, burning sensation, like up my arm, like almost like uh, my arm was on fire. Um, and you'd never felt anything like that, I'm guessing. Eh? No, 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 never, never. Um, but just kind of staying optimistic throughout that process. Cause you know, if, if it's something you hadn't felt before, you don't know how serious it is or, mm-hmm. or anything like that. I just knew that it was, it was probably something pretty serious, but not, you know, until you get imaging and stuff like that, you, you don't know what exactly happened um, to your arm at that moment. Um, but then a few hours later after the MRI, you know, just clarified that I was going to need Tommy John surgery. And then, you know, the day after that, it wasn't just, Hey, you, you tore your UCL, but also um, the flexor um, tore as well. Um, so oh. a little bit, a little bit, more complicated of a, of a surgery and of a, of a recovery. That's why I think it was kind of longer than your standard Tommy John um, that you would see a, a little bit longer recovery process um, just due to the, the flexor um, tearing with the UCL. So from the time that they gave you your MRI and were like, okay, you need Tommy John, mm-hmm. uh, how long did you need to wait before you were under the knife? Uh, so the injury happened Friday night. And then I want to say it was Wednesday or Thursday. Oh, wow. So it was a quick turnover, eh? Like, yeah, it was, it was It was definitely less than a week. Wow. Um, and from the time that the injury was confirmed to the time that I, I was actually in the in the OR. Now, the, the term Tommy John, everyone hears it and not everyone knows exactly what it is. Uh, if And I'm not, no expert, but I it's the ligament in one elbow goes and then they take some ligament from your other elbow, right? And put it in um, there. So there's two areas that I think are, are pretty common where they take the, the ligament from. I think one is, is your leg. I want to say, right. Um, you know, your hamstring area. I, again, I'm, I'm not the, you know, medical professional, <laughs> yeah. but I know for my case, they took it from my left wrist. Um, okay. They took a ligament from my left wrist and then put it, put it in my elbow do you have a sweet scar from and that's that part surgery? of the reason sorry yeah um the the wrist one is 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 little but i i have a scar on my elbow yeah i've seen a, a few people that get tommy john get like baseball stitches on it that's pretty cool. oh yeah yeah how, how big is your yeah scar? i don't have any uh what's how that? big is your scar can we have a look at it or yeah um oh yeah so okay elbow. yeah but um but yeah, I don't have any. Uh, <laughs> I won't be getting any tattoos on it. Do you have um, any tattoos? It's just not <laughs> not a tattoo guy. No, no, no. Uh, haven't really, really gotten that urge to to get Fair one. Um, my wife has a few, but but I don't. So I'm in the same boat. We're the rarities now. Tattoos used to be uh, <laughs> the rarity, yeah. and now if you don't have them, you're in the you're in the minority. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, Tim, how long after surgery did it take for you to start 
working out again, start throwing? Um, so throwing was eight months. So it was a full eight oh. months. Wow. Before, and yeah. that's before you could even start, start building strength back up. Uh, no. So I, I probably would say I was doing some mobility stuff. I actually, like the day after surgery, I was doing some light mobility stuff with my wrist, um, and kind of just moving it, moving my wrist around. But I was in a brace, um, for probably about, oh man, what was it? Probably at least a month if not more. And then, you know, I was, I was immobile for maybe three weeks and then you're slowly opening the brace up a little bit to be able to um, move your arm a little bit more at a time, but still restricting how far you can go in that brace. And then um, two months in the brace and then the brace came off and I had full range of motion. And then from then it was just a matter of building that strength back up over the next, you know, four months or so, you know, th- you know, four or five months, into throwing at that eight month mark. So once you finished up your surgery and you're kind of at the point where you're ready to physically train again, was it the Blue Jays doctors that kind of set out a rehab routine for you? Or was that kind of on you a little bit? Like, were you getting a hold of other guys who had Tommy John? How did that whole process play out for you? Yeah. So, for, I mean, for me, the most, the most nervous I was, was to go under was to, uh, to get the surgery. I knew right. kind of coming out of the surgery that, you know, I was going to continue to work hard. I was going to build up strength and I was going to do everything in my power to come back, you know, the same, if not better than I was pre-surgery. Um, but there was constant communication between me with, with the Blue Jays and with, you know, the physical therapists, the medical team, the trainers, and then the strength and conditioning side as well to kind of formulate a plan moving forward after, after um, surgery. But I was doing all that uh, from home where, uh, you know, I was going to a PT from home who was in contact with the Jays as well and and kind of making sure that we stayed on, on the plan and, and go from there. But I was making some visits to Florida to meet with, you know, the, the trainers and and the medical and strength conditioning staff as well. I probably went, um, you know, maybe I would say like once a month for that first, um, little bit until spring. Um, and then spring happened and I was in spring training for maybe two weeks expecting to be there for the in Florida for the whole season and, and do all my rehab out of there. Right. Uh, when kind of everything shut down, uh, they sent everybody home and I was, you know, on my way home, I stopped at a Dick sporting goods and pay, you know, called the strength coach and was like, Hey, what do I need to get through, you know, the next month? That way there's no like hiccups or delays in my, in my return back. Um, so picked up some, some weights and some kettlebells and some bands and anything I needed. And, didn't expect to be home as long as as we were <laughs> yeah, that's the funny thing hey what do i need to to get through the next month remember when we all thought this yeah. was going to be over in a month <laughs> yeah yeah and then you know you look back and you know i was home you know i went to see the doctor in in june or july um and then after that i i was back in florida i wasn't back in florida until november um so uh but Yeah. I mean, crazy to think, you know, (laughs) I was on my way home like, hey, yeah, what do I need for the next (laughs) month? Not knowing I'd be home for the next, you know, five, six months. Um, Yeah. But I'd say I was probably one of the fortunate ones. You know, I worked out from home for a month or two, um, just out of my basement and doing all my rehab stuff from there. And and, you know, as we got closer to throwing, I was able to find, you know, PTs. They were considered essential in Pennsylvania. Um, So I was able to, to find a PT to work with. And then once you know, my throwing started, I was kind of fortunate where Pennsylvania was open a little, a little bit more where I was able to find, you know, a high school field to start my throwing program on and, you know, progressed into a facility where I was able to do my throwing. Um, so throughout the course of the pandemic, I would say I was one of the fortunate ones who had all these resources to continue to progress in within the rehab. How difficult was watching that 2020 Jays season for you? Because I know we talked to Anthony Telford. He's a former Montreal Expo, and he's actually Nate Pearson's offseason pitching coach. And he talked about his shoulder uh, recovery that he went through back in, I think it was 98. And he said one of the hardest things about a long-term injury is that you just feel so disconnected from the team. There isn't really that that uh, camaraderie that you'd kind of come to, to know and love. And that's been a part of team sports forever. Right. Uh, did you have a sort of like a, a go between guy for you and the team, like a bud in the bullpen or something like that, that kind of kept you apprised as to what was going on. How did you deal with those feelings? 
Yeah, I, I would talk to um, various guys on the team, Ryan Barucki, um, Dan Jansen, Jordan Romano, um, and those those kind of are guys who kind of kept me in touch with the game or with the team yeah. at least. I would say there was a big disconnect not being in, in Florida from just the game in general. Um, didn't really watch much baseball. Um, you know, the Jays weren't on the local TV in Pennsylvania. You know, I was right. fortunate where they were – when they played the Phillies, I was able to watch them. Um, but for the most part, kind of was disconnected from from just the game in general, which looking back, I don't know if it was a, a good thing or, you know, a bad thing. I, I think it was probably a good thing to kind of take a step back throughout rehab and almost reset and recharge and, and not think so much about the game, but continue to take each day with what it had and, and what my goal was for each day and not think too much long term. Um, I think if I, if I was watching baseball every day, I would constantly have the itch like, okay, we got to get back sooner. We got to get back sooner. We got to get back sooner instead of really focusing on each day and what can I do to just improve and progress, you know, just the smallest amount each day of that rehab. That's interesting that you kind of had to compartmentalize each step. Otherwise you're almost torturing yourself, right? <laughs> like Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it was it was fun to watch them when they were when they played the Phillies, and it was fun to watch them in the playoffs. Um, you know, it's definitely it was definitely an exciting team, and still is an exciting team to watch. Yeah, aren't they? Uh, as a Jays fan, we're all uh, pretty into it this year. The boys look good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, still early, but but you know, we're still we're on early. The right track. Absolutely, yeah, it's a good start. So you come all the way back from Tommy John surgery and you enter spring training this year as a guy that maybe isn't at the forefront of the front office's mind when it comes to a spot in the bullpen, but you want a spot outright. Uh, what was your mindset when you reported to camp? Was, obviously this was your goal all along, but how did you go about your business to make it happen? Yeah, I showed up to camp um, mid to late January, knowing that I had a few more steps to take to final finalize my rehab and to get a return back to play um, complete, you know, just some, some bullpens. I had to face some live hitters. I had to do some, you know, uh, simulate two innings in the, in those live ABs and, and, you know, had to simulate a longer inning um, in the live, live ABs as well. And, and um, so those were some boxes I had to check. And then, you know, the, the final step was towards the end of spring, either getting a back to back or what we did was pitch day off pitch. Um, and that was kind of that, that final, final step and final box that I had to check. Um, but, you know, I was just going into spring, like feeling, feeling healthy and wanting to just, you know, make quality pitches and knew when I got back out there that I, that I just wanted to compete and get after hitters and, and you kind of let everything fall where it may. And, and, uh, was fortunate enough to, you know, have it, have a good spring pitch well and, and earn a spot on the team. So very exciting stuff. But again, it was, it was very like a simple mindset where, Hey, just attack hitters with your best stuff. You know, you have a game plan going out there of what you do well and, and, you know, do it, do it to the best of your ability. Control what you can control sort of thing. Exactly. That's exactly what it was, was, um, you know, control the recovery control, you know, when, when it's your time to throw going out there and competing. I can imagine that even now it's still a little surreal. I mean, if you think about the last time you pitched with the Blue Jays, September 2019, it really was a very, very different team. Just personnel-wise, it's changed. Almost at least half the guys are new guys, maybe even more. Uh, what is the vibe like in the clubhouse right now and what has changed from 2019? And even though I know it's early in the year, do you feel like there's a good chemistry within the bullpen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the chemistry is great. Um, you just, you just in the clubhouse, you just feel a lot of, a lot of positive positivity. Um, you know, a lot of hardworking guys, guys who are there to do their job and do and get the, and get the job done. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a great feeling in the clubhouse right now. It's very positive, very energetic. You know, obviously we have, we have a lot of young, exciting players, um, which, which brings that, that, you know, energy to the, to the field every day. And, and, uh, yeah, it was great. You know, it's of course, like you, you mentioned, you know, 2019 was a completely different team. So it's yeah. like, you know, I show up to spring and I'm just introducing myself to everyone <laughs> all over again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, Hi, I'm Tim, one of the longest tenured Blue Jays. Yeah. I'm not the new guy. You're the new guy. <laughs> yeah, you're the yeah, new guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah uh, but, you know, there's there's a lot of great guys on the on the team and 
and a lot of great people just surrounding the team and, and personnel and even, you know, the support staff. So um, it's, it's a really good place to be right now. And that is left-handed pitcher in the bullpen for the Toronto Blue Jays, Tim Meza, who we talked to this morning, and he kind of delved into uh, the last 18 months of his recovery, what it was like making the team again. Uh, just a really cool insight into Tommy John surgery, in all honesty. Uh, you always hear about it as a fan, right? You're always, you're always told, you're, oh, this pitcher's getting it, this pitcher's getting it, and it, it just becomes commonplace. But – it's a very difficult injury to come it back from. It used to from. be a career ender and for sure. It used to be a career ender. Kind of, I guess kind of the same thing with like an ACL injury for football players. Medical science is just Yeah, advanced, for sure. Right? It's advanced so much. And this was an interesting thing to hear from Tim too, was that they're actually taking a ligament out of his knee, stretching it out. His or what was it? His, his yeah. wrist, he said, right? His left wrist. And then he, he even showed yeah. the scar. You know, it uh, no small feat to come all the way back from Tommy John surgery. Big congrats to Tim Meza. It was so awesome for him to stop by and talk to us. That full interview is going to be up on our YouTube page on Friday. So that's the walk-off podcast on YouTube. While we're at it here, I'll give you our whole rundown. We're a Toronto Blue Jays Focus podcast. Thrilled to be joining the 365 Sports Network. Part of the family now. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at walk off podcast. You can follow us on Insta, the walk off podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Again, uh, our schedule looks now like, uh, we'll be on three sixty five sportscast every single Tuesday at six Eastern, which works out really well. Cause most of the blue Jays games are going to start at seven Eastern. So we can kind of be your pregame if you're into such tomfoolery. And then we're still going to continue with the podcast every single Friday morning. Now it was Monday, but we have moved it to Friday. And again, that will be up on Apple, Spotify, Google, all the places you get your podcast as well as our YouTube site. Again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on our inaugural show. Our first time through Mr. Mac, how'd you feel? I survived. <laughs> we survived it was a it was a rough one but like we survived it wasn't that rough it was fine <laughs> we'll work the kinks out as the season goes along right strengthen up absolutely those again thanks so much for listening enjoy uh whatever's up next on the network thanks for listening to the walk-off with scott belford and adam mack join us for a new episode next monday Oh! Oscar with a drive. Jesus Christ! Shows to pitch to him.